with an ideas by providing them uh, specific software solutions, specific technological solutions, and for that we will be seeing different cases across the world, how are communities organizing themselves, how are we doing a process of matching, of putting blockchain developers, uh, people within the IT communities, within local human rights organizations, and in countries like Ghana, like Honduras, like Thailand, uh, like the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States, what has been, for example, at using this kind of technologies uh, within uh, my consultancy that is called humanitarian blockchain. Humanitarian blockchain, it's an e-governance, do-it-yourself uh, consultancy. So first of all, if you want to be an activist, if you want to be involved within this movement, what are the four things that are going to be key for you to try to help global communities? What are the four key products or ideas that you should keep in mind uh, because they're going to be continuing happening across the world and across the years. The first one that I want to show is the Estonia e-citizenship. It is a location independent device, a physical card like the one that you can see in there where you can upload it and anyone can be a citizen of Estonia and eventually if you're living in Afghanistan, if you're living in Syria, if you're living in Cuba, in North Korea, anywhere across the spectrum, you can create your own business, you can create your own startup within European and Estonian law, the Baltic country, the one that is next to Russia, with this Estonian citizenship. Uh, we already applied, many of us, uh, I, I think that we have applied for that one. It costs 100 euros and you can just pick it up within uh, the Estonian embassy in more than 35 countries in the world. The second and a very important one is Bitcoin Visa debit card which is nothing more than what I'm having in here, what I'm showing you guys in here. Hopefully there's no any cameras close in here and no one would actually take a look at this. Uh, so this is a, a, a debit card. This you can order it and it will arrive into your house in about five days. It has the Visa logo, and I'll show you anything in here, or I shouldn't show you many things in here. Uh, it's a regular uh, debit card that is prepaid, it is preload, and why would anyone would need one of this instead of one from HSBC, instead of one from Bancomer or any traditional bank? If you're a woman or a homosexual in the Middle East and you cannot get access to any formal banking institution, if you live within an oppressive regime, or if you're actually a Syrian refugee that is traveling here to Europe and uh, you don't have an identification, you lost your passport because you were traveling and uh, it got sunk or it, would, uh, it, it has water, or uh, the, the UK government, the German government, the Chinese government doesn't allow you to have uh, a form of payment uh, apart from cash. You can upload up to 10,000 pounds within this Bitcoin Visa debit card that can also be anonymous. Third and important thing is what is the role of decentralized autonomous organizations? Why and under which kind of circumstances could we run a business that has three characteristics? Those three characteristics, we believe that they're going to be the future of the blockchain uh, community. First of all, it has to be uh, decentralized. There cannot and should not be one individual, one group, one idea that has a control over, or a, a monopoly control over, over the project. It has to be resilient. What happened if the US government or the UK government, or the Mossad from Israel, or any international organization tries to handle uh, or to negotiate with these organizations. Can they block BitNation? At the moment, BitNation is totally resilient, meaning if the founder disappears, or if the founder cannot control, or is forced to work against the organization, we are resilient. We regenerate in an extremely quickly way. And the third ideas are how can you play, create a blockchain ideas, similar to what Janina said. Similar of how are they gonna be biometric, how are they gonna be digital, how are they gonna take your finger trips, and specifically, how can you have multiple identities? So if my name is Julio Alejandro, you can be Julio, you can have Julio Alejandro 1, Julio Alejandro 2, Julio Alejandro Blue, uh, Julio Alejandro Red, and Julio Alejandro the Communist, or anything that you want to put among those lines. Those ideas, um, I think that they're particularly important for you to see what are going to be the next changes. So in here we have 12 cases that we have identified. 12 cases across the developing world and that directly affects oppressed communities and ethnic minorities communities. Uh, how are you using blockchain technology?
to stop within the first case. We won't have time to go to all, all to many or many of them. Uh, but in terms of human rights violation, there is Pedro Rivera. There is Pedro Rivera, who's a blockchain developer. He sees that in the country in Colombia that is full of drug dealers and it's the government, it's uh, on bed and they have like, they create a lot of uh, problems within uh, human rights offenders, within journalists, uh, within the political oppositions. There, uh, there is a centralized of, um, citizen folder in Colombia where many or most of your private life, your credit history, your mental history, um, your criminal history, your health history, Everything will be centralized within one, uh, one, one folder. When this, the government, what they fear, the journalists in Colombia, is that they would disappear them. That they would take you out of the data, uh, out of their database, and you will not exist anymore. From electronic death, what, we meet, what they fear that might happen after it, it's uh, physical disappearance. Once you do not exist in the cloud, once you do not exist, uh, in terms that you cannot prove that you've been working in a place for 20 years, that you have a children and a wife, that you have some assets as a house or a car, the next thing for you is to physically disappear. Meaning to kill, simple as that. So for that, they have ideas to create a that, uh, biometric blockchain IDs. So if there's an electronic death, there would still be a way for journalists, for them to locate themselves and to prove that their, their existence within the physical world. Within the same ideas, uh, there's some. There, there, half of those projects uh, have been developed, uh, have uh, reached an objective. They are finalized. The other half of them, uh, they're ongoing. Or they're simply labeled as Ethiopia. Ethiopia because it's an organized idea, but no one is actually developing, like, encouraging, or uh, implementing it. We have cases similar of trap of how can you create a block? How could you give IDs to women and children in Thailand? How can you stop the unemployment of formerly incarcerated African Americans, meaning the Black Lives Matter? Within, within this, uh, there's an activist whose name is Edward. It's at Black Beacons. You can follow him on Twitter. And he has the idea that if we create an Uber like employment system where you would only see the criminal record of uh, an African American person or any person for the past five years instead of the whole criminal record. Uh, you, we would be able to put uh, African Americans and Hispanics back into the labor market by providing this uh, employment solutions. We have uh, Ghana, Honduras, and Atlanta. It's a Semitic African American that we do not basically many things. Also, was within the Ethiopia project. In Ukraine, in Estonia, in Australia, in Colombia, in Venezuela. This may be one of the most visible examples. This has appeared within most or all uh, international media. This is BitLand. It's a spin-off of BitNation. Um, and since November 2014, we have allocated 28 communities in the Ashanti and Brongapa region of, uh, of Ghana. So imagine the people in here. They have a river and they're gonna create public and private keys to see who owns, the, who owns the river, who owns the resources, and if we have any problems, or uh, if we have any conflict or, or disputes, how do we solve it individually, regardless of what the government, the politicians do, uh, without killing each other? So these are some other projects that exist. They're not part, I didn't participate in it. Uh, all the credit eventually goes to Susan Tarkovsky, to Janina and uh, to San Johannes, and there are some other projects. Maybe some of you guys want to recognize this guy. You can shoot and can, you can kill pretty much everyone in this room within a few minutes. So this is Chapo Guzman. This is the most dangerous guy alive. Uh, it's a Mexican drug cartel from Sinaloa. And uh, what they control in here, this is Honduras. And everything in Central America and in Mexico were full of drug cartels, organized crime. Meaning we cannot sell or trade any kind of assets regarding buildings, regarding uh, any property. Because if I trade this with you, if the government, I want to trade this glass of water with another person. This other person takes it. Now it's his property, he gave me back his money. The, the drug cartels will force the other person to register, to change the registration so it would belong uh, to the cartel regardless of the transaction that we just made. That exists every hour. There is not a market 
uh, for trading or buying houses in those sorts of places in Latin America. My, I could share personal ideas, personal, uh, I'm from Latin America myself, and uh, those problems are directly affecting them. So within factum, they notarize and they create a precedent saying now some of, the, some of the trading that we're doing, it is gonna be notarized on the blockchain. So if the drug dealers try to take it, at least there would be a physical and impossible to change hash that would show that this, um, that the assets that someone has, that the assets that they traded uh, are still gonna be online and are gonna be visible for everyone. We have, uh, as you mentioned, uh, BitNation uh, started with the refugee emergency response by providing the Bitcoin uh, cards that we just mentioned. How do you create uh, e-voting, meaning in specifically in regions that has been military invaded? Russia invaded uh, Crimea, Ukraine, some months ago. And how do you create this by putting together this team of people in here within our organization called eBox, that at the same time has AmbiSafe and other four organizations, and you put members of the European Parliament, you put the Russian and the Ukrainian government to try to create and identify who exactly are those people and how are they gonna be voting. What are the, exactly the cryptocurrencies outside of Bitcoin? And what are the cryptocurrencies that help for three reasons. You're gonna see the first one in here, it's for oppressive regimes, like it's called Bolicoin, Bolivar coin. It's by immigrants, uh, Venezuela immigrants living in Miami, and they want to send their money back home without Cuba Chavez or Venezuelan authorities uh, interfering with them. So for that, this project, it has raised only $10,000, they have a market cap share of only $10,000. It's very small, it's still developing, but it gives us an example of what are the political motivations of people for using cryptocurrencies and uh, the blockchain. You have blacks in Bitcoin, as I previously mentioned. One organization that is promoting Bitcoin within the United States, but for people of color. You have carbon coin an environmentalist coin, where you would be able to trade, but direct it to environmentalist people. And this one that you can see in here, this one should be the first one that you should recognize. This one is the most popular, the one that has more market accessibility. It's called Aurora coin, and it's in Iceland. This three, one, two, three, that's a Scots coin, that's Sterling coin. That's a UK base, that's a Sterling coin. But I want to focus on this one. And why should I focus on this one if we're living in the UK? I want to know more about the UK. I think you can investigate more about the UK about this. But this, 10% of the population of Iceland, meaning 33,000 people, actually own a part of this technology. They made a helicopter airdrop and gave to every of the citizens of Iceland, small country, Iceland in the middle of nothing actually, um, <laughs> the opportunity for them to have, um, for them to, to have a part of this, of a cryptocurrency. And what is important, it's what is the volatility upon this one, and what is the adoption rate of a group of people. So if 10% of the population of a country, one of the smallest countries in the world, one, one with, the, with the highest percentage of internet access in the world, actually has the capacity to bring 10% of the population to use the cryptocurrency, we should be looking into that. Sure. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll try to summarize everything else. Uh, where do you, if you wanna learn more about this, where are the places and what are the organizations that you should be looking into it? I'll just have time to refer to three of them. Christie Project, I think everyone knows it. It's based in New Hampshire. It is the largest 2,000 libertarian and anarcho-capitalist move to the state. And that is the real epicenter where this idea is, where blockchain and, techno and technology for political use is currently being utilized. 
Liverland, it's a fictitious community that wants to be created, a new state, uh, the newest state within Europe. Most of you have heard of it within the new. Anarchopolco, I think it's worth taking a look at the ideas come specifically out of this podcast. Jeff Berwick, Canadian based in Acapulco, he has great ideas on how to continue this. If you wanted to know a little bit more about the ecosystem or how are we actually working with the internal part of it, you might not be able to work, see, but you would see Bolivar Coin, Christy Project, Pactum in Honduras, Big Land in Ghana, uh, the Bitcoin Visa debit cards, and how are they interacting? We don't have time to go into details. For last, this is our organization. My name is Julio Alejandro again, and we're the first blockchain consultancy for do-it-yourself e-governance and humanitarian affairs. This is some of the services that we provide. Many of them, we just mentioned them, using um, blockchain, Ethereum, DAOs uh, technology. We give thematic analysis and brokerage in terms of um, everything that we just mentioned. And uh, one of the goals that we, that, uh, one of the reasons that I'm here is because we're particularly looking for three people. How can we match if anyone is a software developer in here, if anyone goes within blockchain, try to help us out. Uh, and is anyone interested, is, uh, who is familiarized with the concept of hierarchy? It's a little bit too white this atmosphere, so of course you're not. <laughs> uh, hierarchy, it's uh, systems of injustice or, or of oppression, and intangible oppressions just like white supremacy, Islamophobia, sexism, or other intangible uh, oppression systems for liberation and empowerment. And uh, we're looking for financial and business consultancy for what at the moment is somewhere between an NGO and a for-profit, and we're developing these ideas. Thank you very much. Okay, questions for either speaker, Sam, you want to come to the end of these? Yeah, um, I just wondered, um, I can understand, well, I, I love the ideas, and I love, and I love the idea of reducing the size of